Hello and welcome to this edition of Draw My Study, which focuses on Ray Natal's 1997 study of brain abnormalities in murderers. Following murder, many criminals plead not guilty by reason of insanity, meaning they argue that they are not in a fit mental state to be held responsible for their crime. It has long been believed that such individuals may have abnormalities in brain functioning, which may explain their criminal acts. Ray Natal therefore set out to test this in order to determine if there is a biological component to criminal behaviour. Ray Natal investigated the brain functioning of murderers pleading not guilty by reason of insanity through use of positron emission tomography, which is a brain scanning method used to measure which areas are active when performing particular tasks. But how does this work? A radioactive marker is injected into the brain and is absorbed more by more active areas, due to these areas using more energy. This therefore allowed Ray Natal to investigate and identify dysfunctional areas in their participants' brains. Let's introduce the various areas of the brain which Ray Natal were interested in and their functions. Firstly, the prefrontal cortex is an area at the front of the brain which is responsible for executive functions. These are those functions which allow us to control our behaviour. This area was therefore of interest as research from Damiasso et al. suggests that damage to the area can result in impulsive behaviour and loss of self-control, therefore offering an explanation for criminal acts. Secondly, the angular gyrus is an area at the side of the brain which is involved in emotional regulation. The amygdala has a similar role and is located near to the ears. These two regions, together with the hippocampus and thalamus, have been linked to the lack of emotional control in offenders, so were of great interest to Ray Natal. Finally, the corpus callosum is a large band of nerves which connects the two halves of the brain and acts as a communication bridge between them. This was an important brain area to study, as previous research suggested that dysfunction of this area could lead to poor communication between the hemispheres, resulting in less regulation of right hemisphere impulses by the left hemisphere, and therefore more impulsive and violent behaviour. Therefore, Ray Natal set out to further this previous research, using a larger sample and more scientific methods. Their hypothesis was that violent offenders will have localised brain dysfunction in the prefrontal cortex, angular gyrus, amygdala, hippocampus, thalamus and corpus callosum, but normal functioning in other areas of the brain. Such research is highly controversial as any abnormalities found could be interpreted as a cause of criminal behaviour, thus implying that criminals are not responsible for their actions, which could lead to complications of legal systems. We therefore argue that Ray Natal's research is valuable in identifying biological factors which may predispose individuals to violence, but it should be emphasised that findings are not to be used as a diagnostic tool and that criminals should be held accountable for their actions despite any difference in brain structure and function. The way an experiment is done is referred to as the method. Within this method section, three different areas are discussed who the participants were, how the control groups were set up, and the procedure. The participants consisted of 39 men and two women, which meant that the sample size was 41 people, all charged with murder or manslaughter within the state of California. The mean age of the sample was 34.3 years of age, and the subjects had been referred for many different reasons, such as schizophrenia, brain damage or substance abuse. Participants were instructed to be off their medication for two weeks before the brain scans and the urine tests that they take, they took before the PET scan were all negative. There was a control group formed by matching each murderer with a normal subject with the same sex, age and they used the same identical PET imaging procedures as the laboratory. The schizophrenics in the group were matched with other schizophrenics. So therefore, the control group consisted of 39 men, two women, with a mean age of 31.7 years. For reference, there was no significant difference for the age, and no one in the control group was taking any medication. Furthermore, they were screened before the scan, 
and none had any medical issues related to the study. During the screening, the subject is injected with the fluorodeoxyglucose tracer, which allows the experimenter to see where there is brain activity due to the levels of glucose being used. This tracer takes 32 minutes to be uptaken into the brain, so during this time the participants completed a continuous performance task, which has been shown to produce increases in glucose levels in the frontal lobes and other parts of the brain. This was found by Buschbaum et al. in 1990. Ten minutes before the injection, the subjects practiced this task, and in 30 minutes, 30 seconds before they started the task. This was to reduce brain activity spiked by novelty. After 32 minutes, the subject was taken to the room with the PET scanner and given a unique head mould to keep the head in place during the scan. The brain regions were identified using the cortical peel technique and the box technique. These techniques have been used in many previous studies and are methods of dividing the brain up into smaller sections. The cortical peel technique divides the brain into strips, whereas the box technique divides it up into 3x3 three three pixel cubes. This allows the experimenter to examine the areas more specifically. The results of the study showed that there was a significant difference between the brain activity of the murderers and the control group. Cortical regions are areas of the brain located in the cerebral cortex. This includes the prefrontal, parietal, temporal and occipital lobes. Within, within the lateral and medial prefrontal lobe, there was less glucose detected in the murderers compared to the control group. This was the same as found in the parietal cortex, corpus callosum, the left side of the amygdala and the left side of the thalamus. However, in the occipital lobe, there was high glucose levels, as well as the right side of the amygdala, hippocampus and thalamus. The experimenter also measured areas of the brain where previous research has shown that the damage can cause other mental disorders, yet is not related to violent crimes. The experiment found no significant difference in glucose levels between the control group and the murderers in these areas. Something to note was that there was no difference in the performance on the task completed. Rain concluded that their results supported the information from the previous studies and pilot studies. These results enabled the experimenters to accept the hypothesis that violent offenders will have localised brain dysfunction in areas associated with violence, but will be normal functioning in the other areas of the brain. However, a potential issue when matching the murderers to the control group was that ethnicity, the type of head injury and what someone's dominant hand was, was not taken into account and these factors could have affected the results. Especially as six of the murderers were left-handed and when compared to the right-handed murderers, it was found that the left-handed murderers had higher activity in their prefrontal lobe. Rain explained that the larger the number of left-handed murderers within the sample means that you cannot account for the reduced prefrontal activity. This would be something to take into account in future research by making sure that the murderers were matched with someone of the same preferred hand. This considered the uh, ethnicity caused no significant difference amongst the results and so did not affect the final conclusion. So let's now discuss and evaluate Rain's research. Matched pairs. Rain's research design was matched pairs, meaning that each murderer was matched to a non-murderer control on key characteristics such as gender. A matched pairs design means that direct comparisons can be drawn between a control individual, so a non-murderer, and an experimental individual, the murderer. This is a strength of the research as it limited the effect of confounding variables when comparing the brains of the murderers with the non-murderers. A confounding variable is a variable that unintentionally impacts the findings of the study and this results in the findings not necessarily being the result of the independent and dependent variables being studied. For example, in this study, a potentially confounding variable would have been age but this was controlled for with the matched pairs design. This means that the differences found 
between the brain activity of both groups were solely the differences between being a murderer and a non-murderer, and nothing else. This results in the research having high internal validity. Another strength of RAIN's study is that it had a large sample size. RAIN's study had a sample of 41 murderers who were matched to 41 non-murder controls. And at the time, this was the largest sample of violent offenders ever taken for this type of research. And this is a strength of the study because it increases the generalizability of the study's findings to the general population. Generalizability is where the findings of a piece of research can be applied from the sample used in the study to a target group of individuals in the wider population. However, it's very important to consider that the nature of the research prevents generalisation to the wider population, as the brain differences studied only concern a very specific sample of violent offenders. This means that the characteristics of the sample taken in RAIN's research doesn't reflect the characteristics of the wider population. And in fact, it's difficult even to generalise these findings to other criminal offenders or murderers because the criminals studied were a very specific type of violent offender pleading not guilty by reason of insanity. So, how do we apply this? Additionally to this, Generalising the findings of the study to the wider population presents serious social sensitivity issues. This is where hurt or offence could be caused to members of society because the research is about a potentially very hurtful subject. Diagnostic tool. These findings should not be used as a way of absolving a murderer's responsibility for their actions, which is a very controversial element of this paper. And it's important that blame is not lifted from them as a result of attributing their actions to their brain abnormalities. It would be much too reductionist and simplistic to suggest that the only cause of the offender's actions was their brain abnormalities, and to suggest that the murderers were not at fault for their actions would cause hurt to the families and friends of their victims. What about blame? The findings of the study suggest that the brains of murderers are different to that of non-murderers. However, it's important not to apply these findings incorrectly and take away the blame of the murderers. It's also important that the findings are applied in a way that doesn't elicit social control in a harmful way. Adrian Rain himself said that these results should not be used as a diagnostic tool, which means that we shouldn't use the findings of the study to label people as murderers when they haven't committed any wrongdoing just because they present with this abnormality. For example, screening the population, a form of social control, for individuals with these brain abnormalities could lead to individuals being labelled as murderers or potential murderers. And it's important to remember that not all individuals with these brain abnormalities will be murderers. In fact, Rain himself found that he had the same brain abnormalities as that of the murderers in his study. But, of course, he himself didn't become a murderer. This suggests that there is not a causal link between the brain abnormalities and being a murderer. So, we've heard all about the study, but what actually is the relevance of Rain et al's 1997 paper? Although the study was published in 1997, in recent times, the number of court cases using neuroscientific evidence has grown at a rapid rate, more than doubling in a seven-year time span, therefore suggesting that this topic within the criminal justice system has arguably become of greater relevance than ever before. A meta-analysis of papers that use brain imaging to study aggression, a meta-analysis being something which involves combining the findings of multiple studies to find an overall conclusion, 
found deficits in the brain, particularly in the prefrontal cortex, to be a possible explanation of violent crime due to heightened impulsivity. The study utilised 17 different papers, Brain et al's study being one of them. This increases how reliable and how likely the findings of the paper are to be true, as it is in line with the findings of many other studies. In addition, although PET scans, as used in RAIN's study, have been criticised due to their lower resolution than other scans, this counter-argument can perhaps be discounted as the meta-analysis used studies which use both PET scans and MRI scans to produce the same results. As Antonia discussed, the findings of the study are not to be used as a diagnostic tool, and RAIN has also clarified that the results do not mean that free will does not exist, simply that some are more predisposed to certain actions, but we still have control over our behaviour. A strength of the method is that participants did not take any form of medication for the two-week period preceding brain scanning hence ensuring that differences in brain activity between the two groups were not due to the effects of medication and therefore increases the internal validity of the study. Internal validity being described as the extent to which an experiment's findings as a result of the variable being manipulated. In this case, by not taking medication, we can be more certain that the differences in brain activity are more likely as a result of the independent variable, whether or not the subject was a murderer, as medication cannot confuse the results. Regardless, correlation of results, meaning the association between two variables, in this case being a murderer and brain deficits, does not equate causation. We cannot be sure that murderous behaviours are as a result of brain deficits. For example, the differences may have been as a result of the consequences of the crime, rather than the cause of it. However, Rain has suggested that if such brain deficits do predispose us to violent behaviours, they may be preventable. This suggests that the study has many useful applications, many of which have already been implemented. One example of this is that it has been suggested that drug usage is linked to brain damage within the prefrontal cortex. Therefore, intervention programmes and education to raise awareness of the dangers of drug usage is incredibly important and has hence been a part of the UK's school's PSHE programme since 2016. Furthermore, a 2018 study on students who use an app to raise their awareness of drug usage compared to those who did not suggested that technology as an intervention programme has the potential to limit substance abuse, a factor which has been shown to limit brain damage and hence predispose people to violent behaviour. Apps such as the previously mentioned one are extremely beneficial as not only are they cost effective, particularly at a time when schools are more financially stretched than ever before, but they can also allow for students to gain help without the fear of stigma that may come from conversations in the classroom. This suggests that RAIN's research is not controversial simply for the sake of it, as many other findings produce the same results. And furthermore, such findings can have useful applications in the hope of preventing such crimes through aiming to prevent brain deficits which can predispose an individual to violent behaviour. However, such findings are not to be used as a diagnostic tool and criminals should still be held accountable for their actions, regardless of brain deficits. Thank you for watching this episode of Draw My Study, Rain et al's 1997 edition. Join us next week as we discuss more controversial papers to determine whether they're controversial simply for the sake of it or not. Here is our reference list a list of all the studies which we have mentioned in this episode. Feel free to look in further detail at these studies, as it's always good to further your understanding. Thank you again for watching. We'll see you next time.